what is a virus? Well, what is a virus? <laughs> the definition of a virus is a, a cellular organism. It means it's a, it is an entity which has not the ability to reproduce on its own independently. In fact, it's a dead matter. It's only a stretch of genetic material surrounded by proteins and lipids to protect the genetic material and to carry it inside another cell and organism. It has no own biochemist machinery. It needs a living cell to infect and it abuses the biochemist machine of the infected cell to produce its own proteins, its own genetic material, eventually a new virus particle which is unreleased out of the cell, either just migrating out or in destroying the cell. This, by definition, is a virus. So no living matter, only genetic information, surrounded by proteins and lipids, having a certain size and shape, thus resulting in a certain density, which allows to isolate it very easily from everything else. Because inside the cell you have various organelles, which are all smaller, you know, of different sizes, and there are easy techniques, standard techniques, applied in school already, to isolate viruses. So what is the proof of a virus? Well, the proof as seen in, for example, my publications or in all publications on existing viruses is just that you show you have a viral structure in a supposed infected material, tissue. You make electron microscopes, micrographic photographs. Then you take infected tissue, destroy the tissue, or just take the viruses out by applying different isolation techniques. You do, of course, the same with, so to say, non-infected material in parallel with the same solutions, at the same time, of course. And at the end, you come up with such a test tube. And in the one tube where you have the viruses at a given density, that means in a different level or a certain level of such a test tube, you find something, whereas in the control definitely is nothing. Then you take this material out, you may wash it a little bit, and you find it looks exactly the same like those particles in infected cells, which destroyed the structure of a cell or a tissue. Then uh, you photograph it, and it takes you only 10 minutes. It's very easy, it's standard technique. And of course, it does not look like such things which were said to represent wild particles, because they had to be embedded and just cut in small pieces to be photographed. Real isolated viruses, you may just take inside the electron microscope and photograph them. And of course, as I said, they should look exactly like the particles you see in your infected tissue. Then you take the particles, destroy the particles in order to separate, to size separate its proteins. It's a standard technique and it results in such what is said a bending pattern. This is a tried gel, original gel. You run down the proteins, and of course the smaller proteins run through the gel quicker because they are smaller, huh? and the larger molecules stay at the top. You have this bending pattern, and those are the proteins of the virus. For example, those are the proteins of the virus which I isolate. And this is the direct proof for its proteins. Huh? You do the same, of course, with the genetic material, and 
this will result only in one band because a given virus has only one stretch of genetic material, always the same size. Of course, it has different proteins of different size, resulting in different in a, in a bending pattern in different bands of different molecular wide, wide means size and you will find only one stretch one band one band of genetic material so this is the molecular characterization on the first level which had been done with all existing viruses and then you may do some uh, further experiments you then clone the genetic material it means you cut it in smaller pieces the genetic material and then you study its nature, its sequence. You may express artificial in the lab in test tubes with bacteria, with the help of bacteria, its proteins to study the characteristics of these proteins. Then you may use those uh, genetic stretches to label them with radioactivity or nowadays with other means. And just to take those stretches as probes to detect if something similar is somewhere around. And then if you detect it in the tissue, you may look, well, is there a virus around? Of course, then out of such tissue, you have to isolate or not to detect only such a small stretch by applying this technique. But you have to try to isolate the whole virus as a particle with its proteins, with its genetic material out of it. And then, well, you are sure that you found the same virus in other tissue or in other infected material. No, that's my central point. It hasn't. Sorry, I'll just go again. Because so the question is if HIV ever has been isolated. And that's not true. What has been isolated I'm instead? Sorry, has HIV ever been isolated? The question is if HIV have been or has been ever isolated. And the clear answer is no. And I'll explain you what they did instead. We have to go back in the history of virology, let's say to the year 1970, where the activity of a certain enzyme, uh, the reverse transcriptase, was believed, believed as a proof of the existence of a new type of viruses, the retroviruses. It soon turned out to be wrong because the activity of this enzyme can be found in all human beings, in all mammals, in all plants. So this working hypothesis proved wrong. But what happened in the meantime? We did have with some molecular techniques saying we isolate under certain conditions some proteins which were said to be specific for this virus, but of course never the whole. They had never isolated all proteins from a viral isolation out of such a test tube, for example. At least it was never demonstrated. And what they did instead, I'm going to, to show you right now. The secret of this kind of science is that they have established cells which were able to grow outside their body, right? And the secret is all in there. Those cell lines have certain characteristics when treated in very special way. So they add inside plant hormones, hydrocortisone, mitogens, oxidasin, agents, etc. And then the cell line reacts, of course, in a certain way, producing the signs of reverse transcriptase activity. Of course, they say it's only because we added blood or parts of the blood, serum, from a patient together. And this results in the production of virus because somewhere there's a virus inside and it will infect this receptor cell line, resulting in further uh, amplification or uh, replication of the viruses. And that is absolutely wrong, because 
if you take those cell lines, these special cell lines, and take blood of what they say is uninfected person, and you do it the same, exactly the same way. Keep in mind that what control won't appear in any AIDS publication. Huh? So it will result in the same way. Of course, if they take only patient material from a patient, they never will succeed in viral isolation. They may detect a certain protein of a given size saying, well, this is part of HRV. They will find stretches of genetic material amplified with PCR saying, well, this is part of, of, uh, of HRV. And that is absolutely wrong. I explain you why. First, what they sell us or what they sold the world as being vile particles are not vile particles. And you just going to borrow you the latest issue of Scientific American and there you will find on page 50 the explanation what they are showing to us. Cellular particles for export import of proteins and other materials produced by certain cells and they look exactly the same what they are showing us as HRV. So this is one explanation for what we see in those electron micros microcrafts and on the molecular level they detect HRV only by indirect means. They say if you are positive it means if you have antibody against some proteins you are positive but it's a clear circular argument because they have no vile proteins. They just come up using proteins which in the mixture of those cells and those cells were prepared under severe conditions, isolating the proteins without showing this gel, using those proteins in the AIDS test, in the HIV antibody test, wrongly claiming those are HIV specific proteins. And if you bind against those proteins, you said you are HIV positive. But this is a circular argument because they produced under very stressful conditions those proteins. And imagine if your body under very stressful conditions produces the same proteins, your body reacts in building antibodies against those proteins, thus resulting in positivity. And of course, if you think about the hemophiliacs, which were since 69 were given prophylactically factor VIII preparation, which, which was forbidden before because they, they were afraid of antibody production against those factor preparations because they're very impure. Only 99%, no, 0.3% is, is pure activity. The rest is cellular uh, debris, proteins, foreign proteins. There are all the liver diseases coming from the case of hemophiliacs. And of course, this results in positivity. They have huge amounts of foreign proteins introduced to their body. The body makes antibodies against, and then they come up with a, with a positive HIV test. How is it possible that uh, there are so many papers that have the word isolation of HIV in the title if it's never been achieved? Well, I think this is just a central dogma in this kind of uh, science. For example, if you just look in such kind of books or various other books around retroviral testing or testing for, for HIV, you find the central dogma in the very beginning just saying retrovirus are the cause of considerable human morbidity and mortality. Essentials for quality control and laboratory diagnosis. And you will find no single reference even where the proteins, the antigens used in all those tests were isolated from. You see, this is their hidden agenda. They say in their mixture what they are doing, this business in the lab, that they create 
viruses and viral proteins. And this is a case of self-deception, at least. And deception in case of all other scientists who were supplied by cloned genetic stretches said to represent parts of the HRV genome. Working with this and believing that the original isolation has, has been performed in a proper way. So, you know, all science was based on, on faith, on trusting in inside the techniques applied by other people. And they never had done it. You, you find the word control, you don't find in those uh, literature to mention that you did a parallel isolation attempt with uninfected material. You don't find this. So, and it's just a matter of belief. And of course, they can, for years and decades, go on, well, the virus exists, but it's harmless. Well, we have another model, and now we find it everywhere using PCR techniques. But this is, this is either deception, self-deception, or a bloody lie. Why are people so willing to believe in the virus, do you think? Why are people so willing to believe in the virus? I think this is because people are lazy and there's a tendency to be lazy, to have easy explanations for everything. Of course, it's not that easy. We have to go back more than 100 years in science and you are well aware that people try to explain every illness by the action of bacteria. Koch, Pasteur. We read their literature and you see how they cheated. Read Gaysen's book on Pasteur. You see the fundamental flaws. Only one, three, two, three illnesses he could prove that a bacteria has a role in illness. At least it's there every time or always. And I think you have to realize the dynamic which was inside, you know, modern techniques, you know, science, explaining everything. And this materialistic thinking that we reduce everything down to a molecular level and to, to explain life just on the action on some molecules, proteins or genetic material, I think this is, you have all to keep in your mind to understand why they are always in search to find easy explanation for complex illnesses. Um, what about Peter Duisberg's claim that molecular cloning is the best detection uh, technique for retroviruses? Look, uh, the question is what's about Peter Duisberg's latest claims that finding the soul of a virus is the latest proof for the existence, existence of a virus. Well, I say this, it makes me, it's easy to criticize this point because it's so clear that it's a circular argument. First, in mixing such cell lines with material over years, they enrich genetic materials in such cells because if added, if DNA is added, added, DNA has a tendency to integrate inside the cells. So you enrich it there in order to isolate genetic material of HIV or the other viruses. You take them out, but not, not from this very special cell line. You have to find it in the material of people. So the secret is that it has been enriched here and in order to isolate the genetic material, the infectious clone, you always have to use such kind of cell lines. You never find a hole in a patient. So, and their self-deception or their lie, and I'm using this hard word because it's obvious. And in case of HIV and the fear of this death sentence, we cannot just joke about this issue and come up after 20 years of biology, modern biology, to say this 
all thing about antibodies, biochemistry, proteins is all rotten and we, we just now the new standard of isolation is molecular cloning because what they do? They use another cell line, cells, just add amplified genetic material and then redetect the genetic material inside the cells and say, look, it's there. Look, I think it's irresponsible after 20 years of biology just to come up <laughs> with, with new techniques, with new methods and to say this is the final proof of a virus. You, you just come up with a stretch of genetic material which you say, say it represents the viral genetic material and you pull it onto cells and you redetect it and then you just look, it's there. And because I can redetect it or re-isolate it, what I put in before, then that is the proof of a virus. This is just a stupid circular argument. It's incredible. And I think here the choking and the scientific, you know, this pseudoscience should stop because think of the fear and what, what such tests, positive tests, which you know, such results mean for those people. And I think this is, we have to analyze this uh, by psychological means because people are so much in their techniques, in their concepts. And I hear, hear way often in science, everything is possible. Yeah, everything is possible unless we allow them to make some claim, claims. And if we allow them to make such claims without having a proof for it. And we have to open our eyes and ears and our brains to see where are the circular arguments. But, uh, I want you to say something about vaccines now. The question about vaccines, look, if there is no virus and if they can only detect by indirect means the presence of some proteins said to be specific for HIV but expressed only under severe stress conditions, then to vaccinate it means to make the thing worse. And of course, if there is no demonstration of the existence of such virus, it makes absolutely no sense to vaccinate. Um, can you comment on the principle of vaccination in general? Well, it's another topic and probably it's an overkill. If I would go in, I have a lot of other things to criticize on. Uh, because if you just go into the literature, a uh, history of of vaccination, you will find that all diseases finished or went down long before vaccination was applied. So only to mention. Uh, something we haven't discussed before, but uh, do you have any comment on this recent uh, so-called scandal about the Abbott uh, antibody negative tests that were not supposed to happen? Yeah, about the Abbott test. It's ridiculous that no journalist is asking, well, if there is a test which does not work 100%, not to ask, well, if we have false negatives, what about the false positives? And here you see the central dogma. If they once have a positive, this is their dogma, they say the virus is somewhere. And that's it. It's just an act of definition. Finding antibodies, testing positive, you are positive. You are going to die. You have the virus inside yourself somewhere. And if you are ne negative, they don't retesting with, with you. And because if they would retest you, especially with the genetic test, and perform them in the proper way, not using those dirty molecular tricks, then they may test the same amount of people, of course, positive then they test in the group of antibody positive. Here's a, a technical question. You often hear people talk about PCR and oh yeah. virus. What is the difference between uh, pro retrovirus, uh, so-called retrovirus, PCR uh, for RNA, PCR for DNA? The secret of all this PCR testing is that if they want to test you positive, well, you are positive, you are positive in antibody test, or you are gay and have illness, right? Or you think you are an AIDS case. So, they isolate, they try to isolate certain kind of RNA out of your body. But you know, those stretch proteins eventually misdiagnosis 
as representing HRV are only expressed under certain stress conditions or if you have immunological contact with them. If they are expressed under those stress reactions, of course RNA has to be produced before. And this RNA is detected, amplified and said, well, you are positive in a PCR test. And if you take the starter molecules, which are always needed in PCR, to test them positive with their stretches of RNA, if you take the same stretches, of course, as they do, in testing somebody negative, they are not doing it with the RNA, but with the DNA. And the secret in here is that those stretches won't fit to the DNA because when RNA is produced, the genetic information is slightly changed and it's not, it does not look like the same like on a molecular, on the chromosomal level, on the DNA level. And this is the trick behind this PCR testing. Well, the question is that when antibody tests are not specific because they have, there is no wild isolation, no wild proteins, why not PCR testing is more accurate? In principle, PCR is more sensitive. But if you just, uh, if you are just detect proteins which your own body developed or which you received by blood donations or using factor eight preparations, the same applies of course for the PCR testing. They are using a technique to amplify sequences which were inside your body but only expressed under special conditions. And so the PCR testing as well is absolutely invalid.